from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for Friday the 13th, 2022. The Brewers are finally back home. Starting Monday, the Braves will be in town. And it's game six of the NBA playoffs with the Bucks and the Celtics tonight at the Forum. Bucks in six. An Indiana man who is currently in jail for murder is one of three winners in a Republican primary. <laughs> and he'll appear on the ballot in the general election. Again, he's in jail for murder. Someone has some explaining to do. <laughs> Here's a clumsy segue. Have you ever wondered why aliens haven't landed on Earth? As far as we know, they haven't. NASA thinks it's because they haven't seen us naked and are not making this up. <laughs> to remedy that issue, NASA is sending photos of nude men and women into space. Well, I think just the opposite is true. <laughs> <laughs> aliens are staying away because they have seen us naked. <laughs> okay, check this out. $19,000 worth of watches were stolen during a West Hollywood robbery. The suspects used a Rolls Royce as a getaway car. Hey, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and finally, for the kids listening, we didn't always have spell check. An extremely rare Bible, famous for an unfortunate typo that encourages adultery, has been discovered in New Zealand. Known as the Wicked Bible from 1631, these editions omit the word not from the seventh commandment. <laughs> it says, thou shall commit adultery. If the same error were applied to some of the other commandments, confessions would be so much shorter. <laughs> On the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Paige Ratke, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. We always enjoy a little humor before uh, jumping into what was another, I think, pretty rough week for stocks overall. The NASDAQ down 2.8%. The S&P down 2.4. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closing today at 32.196, down 2.1% for the week. For the year, the Dow down 10.8%. The S&P down 15.1%. And the NASDAQ, a pretty significant 24.4%. We'll come back to that number in a bit, I think. But uh, just uh, a quick note on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. The yield on the benchmark treasury moved lower this week, down 3.12, from 3.12, closing the week at 2.94%. It's maybe just a, a quick look at the numbers this week, but you know what I think more important than the numbers is some of the feeling that's gotten us here, some of the, I think, overall issues that are out there. Uh, a reminder, of course, that you know now down 15.5, we'll call it for the S&P, we were flirting with, you know, down a little more than 18% as of close yesterday. That's uh, that's approaching a, a bear market. And, you know, I think that's a number we, or a phrase we haven't thrown around all that often, certainly don't throw around all that lightly. Uh, but as you look at the S&P as kind of the broad measure, uh, stocks have been pretty well beat up so far this year. You look at the NASDAQ decidedly in a bear market, you know, are you starting to get those questions? What are you telling clients about, you know, how this sell-off seems to be shaping up? I can't say that we ever get used to losing money, um, but it does seem to be that it's happening week after week after week. One of the notes from the Wall Street Journal today indicated that the Dow uh, is on pace for a weekly loss for the seventh consecutive week, its longest streak in more than 20 years. So although our investor clients know that, that stocks do go up and down, um, they haven't seen one that, that's gone down for this long. And whether you call it a correction, which it has been in the S&P, or a bear market as it has been in the NASDAQ, or a bear market as it may end up being at some point in the near future in the S&P, it, it's the concept of losing money. You know, we, we just want to make money. That's all, all we want to do. Well, that's what we want to do with our stocks. Um, and as we've said before, those who are comp compartmentalizing realize that you shouldn't put safe money, you know, in the stock market. Over time, we're confident that you'll make money uh, by being invested. But over short periods of time, if you have questions, comments, or concerns, you should be calling us. And if you have too much in the market, perhaps you should make an adjustment. And I don't think it's ever too late for that. Um, as I commented in, in, in a note to you, 
Um, this is starting to feel a little bit like, and I don't think it's going to be as bad as, but it's feeling a little bit like what happened during the tech wreck. When the dot-coms blew up, it took over two years you know, for that bear market to kind of end. Um, I don't think this is going to take that long. I think we just need some good news on inflation. I think the Fed's doing a great job. But uh, it, it's painful. It's difficult. So, you know, reach out to us. Call us if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Can I ask about the importance of distinguishing a bear market and a correction? And, is, I mean, is, that, is there a sense that after 20 percent that you're nearing the bottom and it's going to go back up again? Is there something – Below a bear? Is there something at thirty percent, like a beluga or something, just to, for the alliteration? <laughs> cup, I don't know. Yeah, cup market or something. yeah. I mean, you can start to define the severity of market declines with some of these terms, and I think Art's point is the one that you know I take away. Any loss is a painful loss, um, and so I'm not sure that there's all that much that we can glean from. Um, you know, reaching that technical definition, not to mention there's a lot of different ways we choose to define this. Um, but, you know, just from a technical aspect, we tend to think of a bear market as a, a movement 20 percent down from a prior market peak. Uh, and you hit that 20 percent and you're, you're all of a sudden in this bear market. But I think the reality is that as we look at what that 20 percent really means, it's not that anything is fundamentally changed. You know, if we look at this week versus last week or the week before, not much has fundamentally changed about what's going on in the world. And so I'm not sure that just putting a label on it changes all that much about the way we view the world. You know, I think as we we look at some of this decline, and Art, you, you know, you, you brought it back to a, a bit of a reminder on, um, you know, what we went through with the tech bubble back in the early 2000s, late 90s, leading into the early 2000s, really. Uh, and it's it's interesting how stark of a contrast there is between some of the higher quality positions. Uh, you know, value stocks, certainly one of those, but even higher quality stocks in other areas of the market. Uh, and then some of those very speculative plays. And Paige, you pointed out, um, you know, the, the really speculative areas of the market right now, maybe not even parts of the, the traditional market that we think of are some of the pieces that have been hit the hardest. Yeah, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, even just look at cryptocurrencies, and I know that's something that we don't recommend our clients invest in. It's not something that I would invest in or recommend to other people. Um, but, you know, people thought that that might be a good inflation hedge. They looked at it as something where you could get some growth that wouldn't react the same way to market news as what's happening in stocks. And what we've seen so far this year is that that's just not true. Um, and with the this week, we had that collapse of a couple of different stable coins, which are designed to help with the transactions among different cryptocurrencies. Um, and I think it's a good reminder to people that, you know, number one, those markets are a lot more intertwined than you might think on the front end. And number two, you know, I don't invest in things that I don't understand and other people shouldn't either. So if I don't understand how the functions work, if I don't understand how to give it a valuation, it's not something that I would ever recommend. Um, but then, of course, you know, to your point, on the flip side, we also have some of those names in the stock market. Um, you know, looking at last year, we were talking a lot about the meme stocks and everyone was piling them in. And, and all I could do was lament over the fact that these companies are not worth what peop the money that people are putting into them. It doesn't matter how excited you are about a name. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter how many other people are jumping in. If they don't have stable cash flows, if they can't meet their debt obligations, if they don't have solid earnings, it's not something you should be investing in. And so I think what we're seeing right now in the market is really a shift away from what is exciting to what is actually generating returns. And you know, personally, as someone who's trained in fundamental stock analysis, I'm at least happy to see, despite all this volatility, that we're getting back to fundamentals and focusing on real investing rather than just those speculative plays. Well, and I, I'm going to absolutely butcher the, uh, the saying here, but it's when the tide goes out that we find out who's swimming without swim trunks, right? And so <laughs> I think the tide has certainly uh, been on its way out the past few weeks, and you're starting to see the ugly ducklings, you're starting to see the ones that don't belong. And yeah, maybe NASA can use some of those photos, Max, for <laughs> uh, some of what they're, what they're sending out there for the aliens. But I think, you know, the reality is that there are still a lot of really high quality businesses out there. There are still a lot of things that uh, are exciting to invest in. And you look at the NASDAQ 100 down more than 25%. Well, remember that 40% of the NASDAQ 100 
is made up of Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla. Yeah, maybe you don't want all those names, but some of them certainly are high quality. And so I think as we look at some of the opportunities out there and art, you know, we, we talk about valuations all the time. We're seeing the forward multiple on not just the NASDAQ, but on the broader markets as well, now back at or below long-term averages. Yeah, that's the first time I can remember that happening in a long, long time. Um, so stocks are getting cheaper, and the companies that the good companies are getting stronger. And one of the other things we talked about, or I, I mentioned to you, was the, the fact that I haven't heard much about buybacks lately. And if, if this selling continues, these companies that do have cash, that do have profits, will start plowing their money back into the markets, and that'll cause stocks to go higher. I'd like to shift gears just for a second back to you, though. You always talk about knowns versus unknowns. And right now, it seems like we know what, what the bad things are out there. And I get more and more questions every single day about what the Fed's doing and concerns about a recession. And it'd be interesting if you can enlighten our listeners with respect to, should they really be that afraid of Fed policy? Should they really be that afraid of recessions? Yeah, I think the the key point here is that recessions are a natural part of the economic cycle. And I think the reminder for so many investors is that sometimes long before you even know you're in a recession, the markets have already digested the pain of that. Uh, and so we know that a recession's coming. We know that it's nat a natural part of the economic cycle. We don't necessarily know when, um, but I think it's less important to long-term investment success to be able to nail down this is the specific day, month, year that it began, and this is the specific day, month, year that it ends, because the reality is investors are anticipating those changing tides. They're looking for opportunities to lean into and away from those risks. And so, you know, I think potentially some of what we've seen in selling pressure is the, the recognition that the probability or the prospect for recession is greater now than it had been. But the other thing is that absent any real significant changes to the fundamental news, which as we said earlier, not a lot of changes in the last few weeks, the Fed becomes the only thing in focus, right? The Fed becomes the thing that they either can do too much or not enough, but nobody believes they're going to get it right. And I think the margin for error is bigger than a lot of people are giving the Fed credit for. I think there's a variety of outcomes that are satisfactory outcomes, and that doesn't necessarily mean that inflation continues forever, and it doesn't necessarily mean we're immediately thrown into recession. And so I think investors have to remember that they're prepared for a recession. We've got pieces of the portfolio that are designed to weather that. The bonds haven't done it so far, but a recessionary environment's a very different environment than the one we're in right now for bonds. And the other piece of that is if the Fed misses on the short side and they don't do enough and inflation sticks around a little while longer, you've got the stock pieces, right? And if you're focused on quality, you're focused on those businesses that can find ways to increase prices and grow earnings, you're set either way. And so I think that's the key. That's the, the fundamental aspect of what we do in, in terms of building this balanced portfolio is you're not trying to bet, is the Fed going to be right or wrong here? You're counting on the fact that long term, the Fed doesn't control what happens. They can help to shape it, but they're ultimately not the story. They're just reacting to this story. You know, Joel, we got some news this week that might concern the Fed on consumer prices, on producer prices. Uh, anything in particular stand out there? Yeah, Kyle, I mean, th those are more of the knowns, right? And and the unknown. You know, so some of the knowns are what's what's causing inflation. We've got, you know, high energy prices. We've got high food prices. We had a report this week on the consumer price index, which is the broadest me measure of inflation. And, and there were a couple of things in the April report that suggested things might be getting better. The the month-to-month -month growth in inflation slowed down for the first time since August. Um, it was the, the slowest rate of month-to-month of -month inflation since, you know, eight months ago. Um, year to year, if you look at that number, um, that also crept back a little. It was 8.3% year to year. Um, that was down from 8.5% in March, but it's still near a 40-year high. But you've got little things in there like 
you know, gasoline prices are up really high. Um, used car prices are up really high, although those have been cutting back the last few months. Food prices, especially grocery store prices, are, are up really high. Shelter prices. Um, so those are all things that, that are going on in there. Uh, and, and then you've got, you know, the, the problem that the Fed has, and, and Art uh, mentioned this earlier uh, in a note that he shared with us, was, you know, the Fed controls the demand. Um, and so it's the supply-demand thing, and, and um, the tools that they have are rather blunt. I mean, they're, you know, they're, um, they're not actually set up really well to, to control all this stuff. So they're kind of trying to control what they can, but they can't control some of the things that are on the supply side. They can't control the, the, the war in the Ukraine. They can't control, you know, the lockdown in China. They can't control all of the supply chain problems that are going on. Um, so, so that's what they're up against. And that's kind of all that supply demand equation is what ends up in inflation. And we had numbers today from uh, the consumer sentiment survey from the University of Michigan that uh, the consumers that they surveyed had the lowest opinion of what their personal finances are since 1973, I think it was. And and 36% of them said it was because of inflation because they perceive that prices are rising so fast that it's going to affect their personal finances so they won't spend as much and that will slow down the economy. But what they say and what they do are two different things. One of my favorite comments of the week, and Mike and I, it, we were having some banter a few weeks ago about going to Vegas. Uh, the first quarter in the month of March, casinos posted in March the best month ever as gamblers return. So just don't worry, be happy, spend some money. And that's what consumers are doing, regardless of what they're telling the people asking their questions. Well, and the other thing, too, is, you know, Joel mentioned that the consumer sentiment, they're worried about their personal finances at a time when most consumers have a lot of cash on hand. They have a lot of savings. Now, we are starting to see signs that those are being dipped into. Um, but but people stored up a lot of cash during the, the um, pandemic, and not all of that has made its way back into the economy yet. Um, and so they might be concerned. They might have gotten used to having that amount of cash in their savings account. But the reality is, is that consumers have the flexibility right now, not to say that we want inflation to stay on for much longer, but they do have the ability to, to sort of pick and choose what they're buying and keep their personal finances in and, check. And Paige, another factor in there is the job market. It's, it's still a really tight labor market. And, uh, you know, we have all sort of anecdotal and, and empirical evidence that people are quitting jobs that weren't paying enough or they're getting raises where they are and they're but they're moving on to better jobs and and they know that there are better jobs out there and that should help too and i misspoke it wasn't 1973 it was 2013. I was well, off by 40 years. And Joel, I think <laughs> I think the labor market component <laughs> is really important to the conversation about recession that we were having earlier. You know, I think we all tend to have a recency bias and we think, okay, technically there was a recession because of the pandemic. The recession before that was because of a destruction of the U.S. housing market and financial markets. We all tend to look at that and think that's what a recession is. Um, but the reality is, is that we could have a short, shallow recession. And when you look at the job market and the fact that, you know, realistically, we're dealing with some level of a labor shortage right now. And so if we do see a little bit of a pullback in the economy, I would be unlikely to see a bunch of layoffs, a bunch of people struggling because we have that demand for workers that's not necessarily going to go away. Hey, Kyle, can I throw one more question at you? Uh, a lot of clients are, clients are asking about bonds. Um, and what happened today on Wall Street is we had bonds go down, yields go up, and stocks went up. So the question is, what is the normal relationship? What should we be expecting, especially with the Fed continuing to raise short-term rates? And not to be overlooked is the fact that the long-term rates went up before the Fed even really did anything. Yeah, I think that's, that's the, the maybe multiple trillion dollar question that so many people have been asking is, what, what's going on with my bond? What's going on with my bond funds? And I think the reality is that um, some of those longer rates were moving higher long before the Fed made any moves, in part in response to inflation and in part anticipation of what the Fed was going to do. And so you had a breakdown between the typical relationship of stocks and bonds. You know, we've always said for years that uh, when stocks zig, bonds tend to zag. 
Uh, and so it tends to be that when stocks are in decline, as they have been for much of this year, you normally see that your bonds are, if nothing else, you know, treading water or maybe making a little bit of money. As long as you're high quality, as long as you're focused on the right places, um, the difference this year has been just how quickly interest rates moved higher, again, in part in response to inflation and in part, I think, in response to some knowledge of what the Fed was going to be doing. Uh, and that has led to this breakdown. Remember that as interest rates rise, bonds that are out there paying lower rates look less attractive, and so the prices tend to fall short term. One important caveat to that, long-term bonds mature at par. Unlike stocks, which are only worth what someone's willing to pay based on expectations of earnings and some modeling that maybe tells them this is how much I, I should be willing to pay, bonds have a, a set price that they're going to be worth when they mature. And so unless you're worried about default, unless you're worried about bankruptcies, and that's not really been part of the conversation, you have some reasonable some reasonable idea of what you should be getting for those bonds. It just takes a little time to get there. And so I think the, the saving grace for bonds has been we know they're going to mature at par. They might be trading at a little bit of a discount right now. But as you get closer and closer to that maturity, you get closer and closer to that par value. The other is that all these new bonds that are being issued at 3% on the 10-year Treasury, roughly 294 as of the close of the week, even better for some corporate bonds, high-quality corporate bonds that are out there, all of a sudden you can get paid pretty decent money to hold some high-quality bonds. And a year ago, 18 months ago, if you were looking for safety, you weren't getting paid much to do it. And so, you know, I've been pointing investors to Treasury markets or even what they can get in a CD and reminding them, hey, this is two or three times what you could have gotten a year ago. And yeah, you had to put up with some pain to get here. But if all we really care about is four or five years from now, am I going to get my money back? And can I get a better rate of return so that I can count a little more on bonds? I'd argue this is a pretty healthy cycle to go through. We just have to get through a little bit of the pain to get there, and that's absolutely what we've dealt with so far this year. Well, thanks for listening. We enjoy doing the program for you. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com.